Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent. Your host here, Richard Carthon. And today's special guest, I was able to actually meet in person at a local Austin meetup that he actually put on himself. Um, has been very enthralled in the crypto community for a while now. He's working on a really cool project. We got Thor Chain and we have OX Win. How are you doing today? Doing great, Richard. Thanks for thanks for hosting me. Of course. Well, thank you for joining us today. Happy to learn a lot about you and everything that you have going on. But first, let's learn more about you. Can you give us some background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'll begin with, I've been working in software for most of the last 12 years. Started my first software business in 2000, 2012. And then in 2014, I moved to Vietnam and started hiring a team in Vietnam. And using Bitcoin was the fastest way to send money, uh, the fastest and cheapest way to remit money to my staff in Vietnam. So that kind of provided my entryway into crypto and stayed interested in it and buying since, uh, since about that time. And then in 2017, during the like 2017, 2018, like altcoin boom, I started trading and investing in different altcoin projects. And some of them didn't really have great branding, great identity, uh, great websites. And so I had some members of my team start doing projects for some of these crypto projects that I was investing in. And that quickly turned into this uh, services business where we were doing marketing and community management services and, and website design and development services for different crypto projects. And in 2018, one of the teams that we connected with um, came to us with an idea for a project. And that project went on to become uh, ThorChain today. And so, you know, still have my software businesses on the side, but over the last three, four years, really devoted a lot of effort into building in the crypto space. And more specifically in the last year, um, just helping build up the ThorChain ecosystem, staying really involved, uh, advising and investing in different projects that are building on top of ThorChain, which we're happy to talk more about today. And then, uh, and yeah, it's been an exciting ride. So super excited about ThorChain. And then, and then more recently, uh, you know, what you mentioned at the top of the call, um, so much of the work that we do in crypto is online uh, with people from all over the world. And, you know, being a, you know, kind of like socially driven person and wanting to connect with people in the area around me, um, you know, together with some friends here in Austin, Texas, we started a, a, the ATX crypto meetup as well. And we've been running that for a few months now as well. So yeah, staying involved in, in different projects uh, in the ecosystem and then, and then just community organizing locally to satisfy that kind of social connection. So that's which, pretty much all of it. Which yeah. is incredible, man, and, and, and highly important. And, and a couple of things that you're able to blend that I really enjoy is that you're able to find um, opportunities and help them with their marketing and getting out to the world and community building. One of the things that we regularly talk about at Cryptocurrent is the importance of building a strong community uh, where people feel involved, can feel like they're being empowered, educated, and, and being brought into the ecosystem that you want to ultimately create. So let's just first start with, with ThorChain. So at its core, you know, what is it? What are you trying to accomplish? And um, of course, the, the ThorChain ecosystem is, is very thriving. Um, I, I know that just from the interactions that I've had with multiple people within that ecosystem. But can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, ThorChain in its simplest form, it's a decentralized exchange protocol. And what that means simply is it's a way for, and what makes it special is it allows users to exchange between cryptocurrencies um, between different blockchains without going through a centralized custodial exchange. So for example, today, if you want to trade between Bitcoin and Ethereum, or swap assets between Bitcoin and Ethereum, the only way to do that is to go through a centralized exchange like Coinbase or Binance or Kraken, et cetera. And if you think about it, that actually undermines the very value that makes cryptocurrencies worthwhile in the first place. And that is you know, non-custodial, completely self-sovereign access and control over your own funds. Like, going, like depositing your funds on a centralized exchange undermines that, defeats the purpose entirely. And so, you know, in the last three, four years, decentralized exchanges like Uniswap and SushiSwap have emerged, which allow for the decentralized exchange between cryptocurrencies, but they've been limited to cryptocurrencies within a single ecosystem, within a single L1, like Ethereum for Uniswap or SushiSwap, or like the you know, Binance Smart Chain for um, PancakeSwap. Um, and these exchanges have done great things for you know, trustless, non-custodial decentralized swapping of assets. Um, but they don't work across chains. Like you can't access, you know, native Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin. You can't trade between, um, you know, maybe eventually Cardano or the uh, IBC chains or Ethereum 
right. using these chains. And so uh, Thorchain now allows for that decentralized exchange uh, between these uh, crypto cryptocurrencies, yeah. Which is highly powerful. And it's it's one of the challenges that I'm starting to see a lot with a lot of the newer projects that are starting to emerge. So you have all these different uh ecosystems, if you will, right? So with um, a lot of Ethereum projects, you can use different things like, you know, a Uniswap to go and exchange between different cryptos that are built on top of it. Like you said, with Solana, those, if you have a Solana wallet, you have certain products that are being built on that and you have to go into you that wallet, create your own thing and have it live there. And the same thing with BSC um, and, and maybe use something like a, a, a MetaMask where you can have the different protocols that live on that. But like, it's what it sounds like, um, like you're saying is to have a, a way to go straight to a point of access in a decentralized way and purchase these these cryptocurrencies and and that is what Thorchain ultimately is creating. Exactly, and if you look at the work that like Uniswap or any or Uniswap or Sushi Swap are doing, like it's it's significant, and they've proven the need for this kind of model. I think um, you know Uniswap has. Uh, $4.2 billion in assets in liquidity pools. Uh, SushiSwap has $3.4 billion in assets in liquidity pools. These are, these are massive affairs, but they're just in the Ethereum ecosystem. You can't pool like Bitcoin or Litecoin or Dogecoin, you know, if you want, and, and you can't trade between them. And so the, the use case that ThorChain brings about, I mean, it, the, the model's already proven in, a, in like a small way with, with these Ethereum-only decentralized exchanges. And so the... Um, the total addressable market and the kind of like optimistic bull case scenario for Thorchain is is massive. And so that that's what excites us about it. No doubt. And, you know, on that, I know this, this has been something that's being built in a, in a long way, but can you kind of give us just a roadmap of like where it currently is, where it's headed? And I know, and also I want to spend some time on RuneBase because I know you're creating a lot of rich uh, content to kind of explain and show all the different ways that Thorchain can be used. Yeah, yeah, happy to. And this is the most exciting, one of the most exciting things about ThorChain. This idea of cross-chain exchange is, it's a holy grail of sorts. And there's a lot of projects that have been talking about it and working on it. Um, and ThorChain, and, and it's a hard problem to solve. So ThorChain has been working on it for three years, started in 2018, um, but it's live now. It launched on what we call ChaosNet, uh, which means it's it's real world assets, but it's in sort of like a in a beta state. So we cap the number of assets that's available to pool. Um, but it's live. You can use it. It launched April 13th. So about three months ago, April, May, June, July, <laughs> about three months ago now. Um, you can swap between currently, I think last I checked, it was 25 assets across five different blockchains. So you have Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, um, Ethereum, and a number of ERC20 tokens, and then Binance Smart Chain and a number of BEP20 tokens. Um, total value locked in what we call liquidity pools right now is around $130 million. Nice. Again, that's with an artificially imposed cap on, on, um, on TVL while, um, while, you know, we're still like working out kinks in, in, uh, uh you know, in the production code and, uh, sp uh, spinning up nodes to secure the network. Um, I have some numbers here currently, uh, 24 hour volume. Uh, fluctuates between around twenty to forty million dollars a day. Um, Two point seven five billion dollars in exchange volume uh, over the last three months. Uh, over half a million swaps performed in the last three months. And uh, the Rune token, which I'm happy to talk more about, the role that the Rune token plays and why it's a extremely well designed uh, token in terms of value accrual uh, and utility in the network. Um, I, have, I don't. Check prices every day, but I think it's hovering around six or seven dollars right now, and I believe the market cap is somewhere in the in the realm of uh, one point five billion um, wow. for the Rune token, which is the yeah. token for the Thorchain ecosystem. So that's a snapshot of where we are today. Yeah, no, which is great, man, and, and to to see where you come from from two thousand eighteen till now. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing. And, and something that I like to always go back to is look at projects who are building for the future and have no intention on just trying to raise a bunch of money make a bunch of money real quick and disappear. Um, the fact that this ecosystem is solving a problem, uh, continuing to hit the timelines and everything that you're kind of projecting out there and, and having something that people can actually use today that is needed, um, very important. And if you don't mind, like can you kind of just talk about like the importance and the value of building that community, putting in the work, because 
I think a lot of people are getting caught up in the, the sense of all of these different projects that are coming and promising the, the world and all these cool things that it's going to be able to do without realizing that it takes time to build those things and that to get to a point to where it's ready to be used and uh, understood and, and used in everyday um, uh, use cases that it, it takes time. Like you said, this has been a three-year process. Can you kind of just speak to that for a moment? Yeah. I mean, that's everything. You know, the team is delivering. The, the project's delivering. It's, uh, it's not vaporware. It's, it's real. And, you know, part of, you know, to, to your point about like, you know, the community being built around at the time it takes and this not being kind of like a, a scam or a pump and dump. One, one of the unique things about ThorChain compared to other projects, but it also has similar to Bitcoin is that the, the founding team is pseudonymous. Like they're actually semi-anonymous. And while that might actually, you know, you know, raise some eyebrows, for the last three years, and you can go on the ThorChain Medium and see this. Uh, first off, it's, it's an open source project. Anybody can see the repos. Everybody can uh, uh, see the code, um, the smart wallets, uh, or the smart contracts, and the, the assets in the wallets. And for the last three years, every single week, the development team has posted a weekly development update. And every month, the team has posted a very transparent treasury update where they break down. It's like an open... Um, open financial statements, like um, like their balance sheet, and uh, you know a uh, a simplified P and L, you know for the month, for the last three years, and and so there's a degree of openness and transparency and execution that's on display in Thorchain, which I think is play, ties into you know even though there's this kind of similar with Bitcoin, this mystery surrounding its genesis, like who the founding team is. Um, you look at what's been built and what's been delivered. And how like pragmatic and just I don't know, like the, like how how like well they deliver, and I think that's what the community gets excited about. And to your point about community, I think one of the things that Thorchain has just nailed is if you go on crypto Twitter, and this is something that I started getting into over the last six months, um, and then really deep on over the last three months since April, the Thorchain community on Twitter is. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously hyper biased, but it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's one of the greatest, I think the Link Marines are, are really well known and famous for being like a, just, just a really strong community. The ThorChain ecosystem is, is uh, and community on Twitter is, is also just extremely strong. If you ever see like this lime green, it's like a green to aqua blue gradient halo that circles people's avatars on Twitter. That's kind of, um, that's the badge or signal of the, the ThorChain ecosystem. And there's a number of really, you know, well-spoken, educated, uh, you know, pseudo influencers. I don't love that term, but, you know, uh, influential accounts uh, in the ecosystem that I've started to, to dabble in as well. Uh, on Twitter, I'm 0x wing, and we can drop that in the show notes. Um, and it's just a great community of people who are excited about the project because of, you know, what it promises to do, what it's delivered, and yeah, this just the strength of the of of you know almost everything around the project so far. So, without sounding like too biased or bullish, yeah, I'm just extremely you know happy and excited to be a part of the community. It's a it's a great one to be engaging in. Absolutely, and I've actually seen some pictures with people with that and never knew. So now I know, and I'll I'll be able to call it out next time I see. So thanks for thanks for pointing that out. But you know, for a person that's listening to this right now, and they're like, "Wow, this sounds really great." I'm actually been looking for something like this. You know, how do how would someone come on and start using Thorchain and start be able to engage um, in in ha- getting some of these different assets? Yeah, yeah, I think there's there's a couple things to to think about here. I mean, there's the product using, you know, using ThorChain itself to exchange between assets. You can also, you know, like, I mean, I imagine a lot of your listeners are familiar with like um, liquidity pools and how like DEXs and automated market makers like Uniswap and SushiSwap work. Like, give me an idea. Right. Like, who, who are your listeners? How, how familiar are they with like Uniswap, SushiSwap? From, uh, pretty familiar. So we have a large spectrum. So we bridge the gap between people who know nothing about crypto and blockchain with thought leaders in the space. So we have everyone from your noob to your absolute crypto OG and everything in between. All right, cool. So I'll speak kind of to the middle of that then and kind of assume some amount of, uh, some amount of understanding, but then also just provide some additional context for those who might not understand yet. Um, but, you know, these decentralized exchanges like Uniswap or SushiSwap, um, there are users who swap between assets, you know, like I want to swap my Ethereum for, uh, you know, Chainlink. 
Um, and so I come to uniswap.org or sushi.com sushi and I swap, I make that swap. Um, and when I make that swap, I'm trading in and out of what are called liquidity pools. Liquidity pools are static pools of assets that other users on the network have, have deposited into the network for other users to trade against. In exchange, they earn a percentage of the exchange fee that the traders pay, right? So you have liquidity pools that are pulled by uh, liquidity providers. And then you have traders that come in and make a trade in and out of those pools. And they pay a little bit of a fee. That fee goes into the pool and is eventually passed on to liquidity providers. Um, and this, this is commonly referred to as AMMs or automated market makers um, or decentralized exchange more broadly. Thorchain borrows on that notion and except that it, you can pull liquidity and trade between assets across different blockchains. Again, so you can trade between Bitcoin to Ethereum to Litecoin to you know, BEP20 tokens and ERC20 tokens, et cetera. Um, and so there's multiple ways to participate in this, um, as a, you know, as, as someone who's interested in checking out ThorChain, um, I'll explain like from top to bottom. And then those, I imagine there's also people, and obviously this isn't financial advice, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the Rune token and how to get exposure to the growth of this network. If it's something that you're excited about, um, first as a trader, if you want to swap between assets on different blockchains, without going to a centralized intermediary. So this is without using Bitcoin, I mean, sorry, without using Binance or Coinbase or FTX. Um, you know, you, you can just use any ThorChain powered exchange like ThorSwap.Finance, um, Asgard.Exchange, Skip.Exchange. There's multiple different exchanges that integrate with ThorChain and you can just go to one of these exchanges and swap your assets. Um, another interesting thing about ThorChain, which we don't have to get too technical here, but ThorChain is, is itself, users won't interact with ThorChain directly. I hope this doesn't get too confusing. It's kind of like email. Email is, is underpinned by a protocol called the simple mail transfer protocol. And users don't interact with the simple mail transfer protocol directly. They interact with email, uh, email applications like Outlook or, um, or Apple Gmail. Mail or Yahoo Mail or Gmail, exactly. Mm. Um, for ThorChain, you would just use a, an exchange that integrates with ThorChain. And so I mentioned a few already, and then there's even exchanges that you're not even going to realize are using ThorChain on the back end. And this is going to become more and more common. So Trust Wallet has already integrated ThorChain uh, Rune Token, and they will be integrating ThorChain as a decentralized exchange on the back end shortly. Shapeshift, who many users will probably be familiar with, integrates yep. ThorChain on the back end. So if you're trading between assets on Shapeshift, you're actually using ThorChain's liquidity pools. Um, so from an exchange layer, you know, it's very simple. Just you know, go to one of these exchanges and, and you can trade assets. Super simple. Um, the second layer down, if you want to earn yield on your assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Binance Coin, you can provide liquidity into ThorChain liquidity pools. And you can do that through a lot of these exchanges that I already mentioned. So uh, ThorSwap.Finance is a great place to go, or uh, Skip.Exchange is another great exchange. And there's many more to come. We can talk about the integrations to come uh, a bit later. And by the way, if, if anybody wants to go learn more about this, um, we'll talk more about this, but my, I, I have a website dedicated to educating on, on these techniques. It's runebase.org. So a little shameless self-plug there. No, um, for great plug. It's, it's, it's highly educational. Thank you for, I was actually going to bring this up yeah. in a moment, but absolutely bring this up right now. So runebase.org. Yeah, we'll highlight that. So if, if any of this, you know, kind of isn't coming through over just like audio right now, you can go and, and I have video and, and written guides on, on most of these components. Um, and so you can provide liquidity uh, by pooling your assets into these ThorChain liquidity pools, and then you can earn percentage yields. And some of these percentage yields are upwards of 20 to 30% on things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, BUSD, USDT, et cetera. Um, and so you can provide liquidity. Um, there's other ways to provide in the network, like, like um, you know, securing a node on the network or becoming an arbitrager, but those are slightly more technical and I think a bit out of scope for this conversation. Um, and then the last thing I'd mention is for anybody that wants to, that's excited about ThorChain and wants to participate in the growth of the network, there is the Rune token. And Rune is the native token for the ThorChain ecosystem. And 
what excites the ThorChain community about the Rune token is that, I think the first thing to note is that not all tokens are created equal. Um, certain pr- different crypto projects have different degrees build or design different degrees of utility for their native tokens and how well, how much utility that token has within that network will create different levels of what's called like value accrual. So if a token is, if a network is growing and a token is like extremely important and critical to run that network, that token will, will grow as the network grows in value. But then there's tokens like, frankly, like Ripple or the Uniswap token, which aren't really directly, they don't have that much utility um, associated with the actual use of the platform. Like the Uniswap token, you don't need it to provide liquidity. You don't need it to exchange on Uniswap. The Uniswap token is a governance token that helps you, that gives you a vote in what and where to direct the Uniswap treasury funds. Um, And so it doesn't have that much direct value associated with the growth of the Uniswap network. The Rune token's importance and value and utility in the ThorChain ecosystem gives it a lot of uh, uh, just world-class value accrual. And uh, really quickly, I'll just give like the the high-level overview of of what that looks like and how you can calculate a baseline value for the Rune token. Um, And so essentially... The Rune token serves a few purposes in the Rune in the ThorChain ecosystem, but the two that are the most important for the purpose of this conversation are that any liquidity provider must pool Rune token alongside their the other asset that they want to provide liquidity for, and we'll talk a bit about that. So first, as a the liquidity base pair asset, and the second would be as a security deposit that node operators have to deposit to the network. In order to, in order to earn yield on that and and, and to secure the network, um, and so really quickly as a base pair liquidity asset, we mentioned earlier that liquidity providers on the Thorchain ecosystem can pool their Bitcoin or their Litecoin or their Ethereum or other tokens into Thorchain liquidity pools for other traders to trade against. When they provide, when they deposit that Bitcoin or Ethereum onto the network, they have to pool at the same time Rune token one to one in terms of dollar value um, yeah. when they when they do this uh, when they provide this liquidity. So, if I want to pool a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, I have to also pool at the same time a thousand dollars worth of Rune token, and every pool on the Thorchain ecos- uh, in the Thorchain network is made up of the main asset plus Rune. So Bitcoin plus Rune, Ethereum plus Rune, BUSD plus Rune. And then every trade happens in and out uh, through, those, through those pools with Rune as the, the middle asset. So if you, you want to trade from Bitcoin to Ethereum, what's happening on the back end is, your, is the trader is being routed from Bitcoin to Rune to Ethereum and then back out to the user. So long story short, with this one-to-one symmetrical pooling does is it creates a one-to-one value of Rune to, to total value locked in liquidity pools. Um, it, it, it's, it's a base, it's a floor demand for a Rune token. And so that's part one. Part two, or first, do you have any questions about that or was that clear? No, so far I'm following along and I'm sure with it, uh, I know that you have some content and videos and we'll make sure to go and add those into like uh, for people that want to go and follow along this, because uh, for the noobs out there that are listening to this, it might be a little over your head. That's okay. But something like this is important to learn early because what right now uh, with uh, Mr. Wynn is, is sharing with us is a ton of different ways that you can earn money and yield within your crypto, right? Within ecosystems, you now have anywhere from two to four different ways by being a part of the ecosystem that you can earn money. And what he's trying to do is explain those different ways that you can go and accomplish that. So if, if earning a little bit more money with crypto, you already have interest you, uh, keep, keep tuning in and keep, keep following along. But yes, by all means, please continue. Yeah, absolutely. And to that point, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm actually, depending on when this airs, I'll, it'll probably be live already. I'll, I'm going to ship it tomorrow or on Tuesday. I'm, uh, releasing a free uh, friendly, I'm calling it the friendly guide to ThorChain. And it has visuals for everything I'm talking about now. So if 
I'm imagining just hearing me talk about this can be confusing, um, but I kind of animate this with uh, with some visuals in the friendly guide to ThorChain. So that'll be available at runebase.org here awesome. in the next few and days. And we'll make sure to include that in the show notes for everyone listening if you want to uh, keep learning a little bit more about that. Awesome. And so what we're talking about right now is the baseline value for the Rune token and where it's going to drive its value from as the ThorChain network grows. The first thing we mentioned was this uh, base pair asset. So all liquidity providers have to buy Rune in order to stake assets on the ThorChain network and earn yield on it. So that's part one. And then part two is uh, as a security deposit that node operators have to have to deposit in order to earn yield on, in order to secure the network in exchange for rewards from the network. Um, and so a node in the ThorChain ecosystem is are, are users who are running the ThorChain application. So they are managing the wallets, they're verifying inbound transactions, they're, they're securing assets in the system's wallets and smart contracts. They are running the ThorChain application they are verifying inbound transactions when someone makes a swap and they are sending outbound transactions to that swapper. Um, and so these are, these are the machines that are like, you know, powering this system. Um, so similar to like miners for Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? In order to run a node, the node operator has to bond a lot of Rune. And right now, I think that's around $5 million worth of Rune. And I, I, I think that'll grow to 1 million Rune. Um, it's somewhere between three to $5 million worth of Rune today, and that'll grow over time. Um, so they have to bond a lot of Rune. And what that does is it, it aligns their incentives. It gives them skin in the game because these node operators, it, it's like a security deposit for a tenant, right? When you lease an apartment or you lease a house, you need to put down a security deposit. And if you, for bad, like that security deposit can be slashed if you have bad behavior, right? If you like, you know, put a hole in the drywall or something. Um, and so the same is true for these node operators. The, the bond, the, the rune that they have to deposit serves as their security deposit. It can be slashed for bad behavior. Um, but then they earn yield on that deposit. Um, and right now that yield, it fluctuates between, I think, I want to say around 20 to 30%. I haven't checked in a few days. Um, and then they also, and so collectively, all the nodes on the ThorChain network have to bond or have to deposit twice the amount of assets that are pooled in liquidity pools at, in Rune uh, in terms of dollar amount, right? And so what that does is it creates this economic disincentive, even though they have a position of technical like you know, control over the system funds, at any given point in time, they actually have more to lose in their value of Rune than they have to, than they stand to gain by abusing their position of power and like, for example, draining uh, funds from the system wallets. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're economically disincentivized uh, to, for bad behavior. And so in summary, the baseline uh, demand and value for Rune token comes from liquidity providers pooling Rune one-to-one -one with TVL and from node operators pulling Rune two to one uh, to TVL. And so you have a floor price for Rune. If you add those up, the floor price and the floor demand for Rune token is going to equal three times the total value of non-Rune assets pooled in ThorChain liquidity pools at any given point in time. And so this is highly summarized as 3x TVL is what's known as the baseline or deterministic value for the Rune token. Um, and so that's the kind of, that's, that's the baseline utility that the ThorChain uh, Rune token offers. So yeah, yeah and thanks for breaking that down. Yeah. And like, no, I mean, I know there was a lot of different sections of it, but it's good to know because a lot of times we'll have these projects or, or people that will come and talk about this as a very high level without having someone come and like break it down for people to follow along with. So for everyone, if this is your first time hearing that, please go back, re-listen to it. And it, it's good to just familiarize yourselves with these different terminologies and, and ways that the... Uh, you go, uh, you, you kind of flow through how all this works. And so again, we're also going to have in the show notes, um, a video of, of, of um, Mr. Nguyen going into a, a deeper dive of this. But again, thank you so much for, for diving into that for us. Um, just a couple more things that I kind of want to dive into. And what I think would be really fun to hear just from your side of things is just the current outlook of crypto and, and where we've been from the beginning of the year to where we are about midway through the year now and where you potentially think uh, things are headed. So like if you had to take a holistic 10,000 
foot view and you could look at either the rest of this year or even the next, you know, two to five years, what do you think are some things uh, that are on your mind that you think other people should be uh, looking out for as well? Oh man, I could geek out on this all day. Where to begin? Um, yeah, one of the things that's super interesting about crypto to me is like the macro geopolitical game theory that's happening. You have, for example, like China was never going to play. You know, that, that was always going to happen. You know, they 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 locked down the open internet. You know, de a decade and a half ago, obviously they were going to lock down crypto. So that's not too surprising. The bigger, a big open question for me is what U.S. regulation is going to look like over the coming years or months. I think this is a current hot topic. Um, and, and this is actually, you know, like geopolitical game theory playing out right here. Like the U S has it. I mean, it's, it's in this kind of interesting spot. It has a lot to lose as you know, it had like the U S dollars, the global reserve currency, the U S financial, like traditional financial uh, system is, you know, the seat of it is in, is in the United States. And it, it you know, it might, the U S might be facing a sort of like you know, Stephen Christian, as Stephen Christian, uh, the innovators dilemma, you know, classic innovators dilemma here where like, you know, does Bitcoin and uh, decentralized finance kind of unseat and, and, and wrestle away a lot of the leverage that the US has over the world. At the same time, everybody wants the next Silicon Valley to be, you know, on their shores. And if that's happening now in decentralized finance, does the US, you know, let this evolution happen? In the United States, or does it, or does it, you know, come in with heavy-handed regulation and push this out? So, for China, it was always going to be no. For the U.S., it's not a no-brainer in either direction. There's a real kind of like tricky, you know, game theory equation to, to navigate there. And then you have this whole world, and this is what you're starting to see play out in Latin America, El Salvador, uh, and uh, and other, you know, LATAM countries that are like, hell yeah, like, let's embrace it. We have nothing to lose. We can, we can depoliticize our money. We can depoliticize our financial infrastructure. Um, our citizens can get access to world-class banking and our world-class currencies, financial products, banking products, uh, and investment opportunities. Like these things were traditionally like you had to have a U.S. bank account and passport or European bank account and passport to access these. So the, the dream of like global decentralized finances is, is like playing out, I think in real time now in developing countries uh, which is exciting. I do think that, you know, the, and I'm not a lawyer, and so I'm, I, I'm not super deep in this space. But you know, U.S. regulations is is the biggest open question for me. And I think, you know, I think what it looks like. I, I really think at the protocol level, there's not too much to worry about. I think like like protocols like Thorchain, in my in my opinion, are they're not the user interfaces. And I, I think where regulation is going to come down is is going to be on things like. Um, you know, KYC, AML, just, just clamping down on the completely anonymous um, component of, or not completely anonymous, but pseudonymous, unidentified component of a lot of decentralized financial services. And so I, what I think might be, you know, might be a realistic thing is like US-based front-end interfaces and applications will no longer be able to access, uh, will, will be able to, um, you know, uh, provide these same services without doing some amount of, without being responsible for, an updated, updated guidance on like who, what, what kinds of services have to do KYC and AML, like provide identifying documents. Um, but I think broadly, you know, these protocols will still exist to underpin, um, like underpin all of these front end services. So like SMTP, HTTPS, TCP IP will exist. And I think Ethereum, uh, Thorchain liquidity pools, uh, you know, Chainlink, uh, you know, Oracle protocols, like all of these like open protocols, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be, hard to lock them down because of, uh, hard to regulate them because of their, their, you know, technical nature. But um, yeah, broadly, I'm, I'm a extremely bullish on the space. I'm very interested in seeing how the U.S., you know, regulation will start to unfold over the, over the coming months and years. Um, and uh, I think it's, I think it's a, an inevitable frontier that uh, it's extremely exciting to be living through. No doubt. And and thanks for, for breaking all those down. There's a couple of things in there that like, I strongly feel the same. The U.S. regulation, um, although during COVID, they kind of just took it to backstage and said, look, y'all do what you do. Now you're starting to see, uh, you know, like Elizabeth Warren basically saying by the end of July, we need to have uh, some more regulations around this. They're trying to figure out what they want to do. I agree with, with China. So even with China, like they were never truly going to play nice because they're going after CBDCs. And I think they're going to be the first one to really roll out the digital one and make the rest of the world try to uh, get on board with using that as a, a currency. So of course they're going to try to push that away. So that's, whole nother topic for another day, but happy to unpack that with you one day. And then just 
as the the rest of the world, um, more developed countries, it's like you said, it's providing this access to a, a potential more stable currency slash an opportunity opportunity for a currency that could appreciate in value instead of absolutely getting demolished and, and inflated, um, as well as having power uh, to to use that then asset to get some of those institutional um, opportunities that uh, and, and access to ways to make money that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, a, a great way that someone always break this down. Like if, if you had to flee your country right now and what asset would you bring with you? And this is the United States. This is any country period. If you had to flee your country right now, what asset would you want to have? And I mean, the, the quickest answer is probably Bitcoin because you can put it on a flash drive, you can get out of there. You can then go to whatever countries, switch it to the local currency and you're good to go. Um, so, so yeah, man, I, I definitely appreciate that take. And, and on that, man, you, you've dropped a ton of knowledge for us. Uh, we, a lot that we can unpack, uh, but kind of, as we kind of wrap up here, I have, I have final two fun questions for you. One is with all the knowledge that you have right now, if you could impart one to two pieces of wisdom to yourself when you first got started or to that crypto newbie, you know, what would you tell yourself? Ooh, man. Uh, am I going back in time here? Because then I could just make some specific <laughs> purchase recommendations or am I talking to a newbie today? To yourself or a newbie, however you want to. Today? Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, man, that's a that's an interesting question. What would I tell a crypto newbie today? Um. I, it's, it's not a succinct answer, but it's, it's kind of like a meta learning thing, which is like, how, how, do, how would I recommend someone go about learning more about crypto? Um, you know, finding trusted sources, I think is a big deal. And in the crypto space for me right now, I think the best education, finding two things and, you know, you know hat, hat tip to you, uh, finding good, YouTube channels, I think is, is a great entry point. Um, you know, YouTube channels, you know, you get the audio plus the visual component and if you find someone who, you know, knows what they're talking about. Um, there's a lot, and there's a lot of, you know, obviously shit out there that you got to wade through and there's a lot of yeah. noise. And so you find the right signal. Um, you know, you can, you can do great by that. So find a YouTuber that you trust. Um, and, uh, and then another thing would be crypto Twitter, crypto Twitter I never got it before three months ago, like, or before in the last, like this year, really. Uh, I never got Twitter more broadly. I mean, I always had it, but I didn't really go deep on it. And then you realize over time that Twitter is the only medium where that it's the only medium that moves as fast as, as, as crypto, you know, at the speed of development of crypto, um, blog posts, even YouTube, um, but uh, blog posts and websites and, uh, you know, like Medium, they don't move in real time with, with the flow of new information that's happening. So when like critical things break, it's breaking on Twitter and, and propagating through the community that way. And so, um, and so, you know, finding, you know, key accounts to follow in the ecosystems. One, one trick I like to do is if I find a new token that I want to research, if you search their what's called cash tags on Twitter. So like, for example, I'm talking about ThorChain. If you search dollar sign rune, or if you're in Ethereum, you search dollar sign ETH and you look for latest posts, top posts uh, for that search, you know, you can find the most relevant posts in that, in that ecosystem. Um, and of course, a lot of people are spamming those cash tags. So you kind of got to wade through some of the muck there sometimes, but, um, and then you start to follow the best accounts and you kind of want to be a little bit critical and, and curate, uh, you know, curate your, your Twitter feed, you know, pragma or very patiently and pragmatically. And that's where you can really tap into some of these communities. And then if I may add like one more thing that I would say yeah. is that, you know, these projects are always open to people getting involved. Um, the way that I'm getting involved, cause I'm not an engineer and I'm also not, I'm non-technical and I'm also not like a crazy deep finance or economics mind, you know? And I, and, and so like, if I want to get involved, what's my role going to be in, in something like Thorchain? Extremely technical on one end and extremely financial and economical on the, or economic on the other end. Like, um, you know, there's some really, you know, every conversation I'm in, I feel like I'm the, the smallest brain in the room, which is a nice, nice place to be. Um, but there's a role for me, you know, like I, I, I'm a, I, I digest this content uh, and then I can, I can educate on it and I can, I can teach people out. I can explain it in a way that, that other people can understand. Um, and that's something that, you know, a lot of the developers or engineers like either, you know, 
don't necessarily have that that empathy for normal you know normal minded people or they just don't have the time um you know they're just busy building so so there's a you know you can get involved in these projects and take initiative and find yourself a position and and be working in something that for my money is like the most exciting intellectually engaging financially uh you know financially opportunistic and even philosophically or politically or socially kind of engaging uh industry that I've ever been a part of. So yeah, just, just find your, find your entry point and get involved. I think that's great advice. Uh, keep finding great resources and, and making sure you're being around people who aren't just shilling and, and trying to get you to buy a thing, uh, but engaging and, and actually trying to empower you so you can go and make your own decisions. But, you know, as we wrap up here, um, OX, when, you know, what is a final thought that you want to leave with everyone listening? Man, final thought. So, uh, Ah, oh, man, I could go so many directions and I want to like, my initial thought is like, don't shill, don't make it a shill. But, uh, I mean, one of them would be like, uh, I don't know, I'm so enthusiastic about the chain, So keep your eyes on that. Um, and yeah, I mean, just, just for me, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll touch back on this, like crypto for me and for a lot of other people, it's, it's, it's the most, and I'm sure a lot of your, your audience will be able to relate to this. Um, so depending on who I'm talking to here. You know, this could, this could be like, I'm just preaching to the choir, but it, you know, it's just like, be excited about, don't worry about the price movements, be excited that this is like one of the most foundational, you know, technical and financial, uh, uh, innovations of, a you know, in, in human history and we're right on the cutting edge of it. And, and it can, and you can find so many ways to be fascinated by it, whether it's with a, with the, you know, the money to be made or the technologies and the products to be built, the social aspects of how this can be a democratizing force and inclusive force for, you know, financial freedom and sovereignty across the entire world. Um, whether you're into economics, geopolitics, game theory, um, whether you're a crypto anarchist or you're, uh, you know, a libertarian or you're, uh, liberal or conservative, there's so many ways in which you can be excited about, about, uh, cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain technology and, and yeah, just, just let that passion and that excitement carry you and, and uh, don't worry about the short-term price fluctuations. No doubt. And it's that passion that's important. And everyone listening, I'm sure you could hear your passion today. So thanks for coming and sharing all the information that you did. But of course, as we uh, kind of bring this to a close, what are ways that people can connect with uh, you, learn more about ThorChain, uh, get access to your... Um, get access to all the, the information that you're dropping. I believe that's runebase.org. And then also if they happen to be in Austin and want to come to one of the meetups, if you want to um, add any of that information as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, for all, to get a hold of me, it's on Twitter, 0xnguyen, N-G-U-Y-E-N. And my resources are all for free. I'm not selling anything. So it's runebase.org on Twitter as runebase underscore org. And you can search that on YouTube or any podcast platform, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. Uh, and then in terms of you know, our local meetups, if you're in Austin or the uh, local area, you can find us at atxcrypto.org or on Telegram, atx underscore crypto and connect with the community there. So I got a few fun things in the works. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Alex Wynn, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, for everyone listening, stay cryptocurrent.